Hello audience, and Happy New Year. A little late for that, but whatever. In this video, we're going to look over the frame on this car and check it for damage, whether it be collision related or just from old age. And in doing so, I'm just going to talk about Model A frames in general, the problems that they are prone to, and the ways that I look for them. Now, if you haven't been following the video series on this car, this is a 1930 Deluxe Coupe that's been rear-ended and we've been repairing it and part of the job is we need to examine the frame see if that was damaged from the collision either prove that it hasn't or document what has been damaged and whether or not it needs to be repaired now with cars this old it can be somewhat difficult to actually determine what is damaged beyond repair and what isn't what should or shouldn't be used because new replacement frames are just not available at least not right now and perfect originals are really difficult to find. So if you're looking for a frame for your project car, you just may not find a perfect one. You may not even find a better one than one you already have. So sometimes just for the sake of keeping these cars on the road, some compromises need to be made. So that is something to keep in mind when you're looking this stuff over. Anyway, let's get started. We'll start with the visual inspection. We'll just look at it. And one of the first things I noticed about this frame is there's not really much rust pitting on top of it. Just a little bit right there and that's it. The top of the rail usually gets rust pitted really bad from the body webbing, water getting trapped in it. But this looks really nice. You can still see the machine marks on it in some places. It appears to have all the original rivets for the front cross member, and they're not loose like they've been stressed or anything. Front cross member looks pretty good. It's not uncommon for these to crack right here, just from stress. In fact, I've seen these split in half sometimes. And because of that, it's not uncommon to see additional plates welded on here. But this has none of that. So it's pretty good. The frame horns, again, these take a beating, so it's not uncommon for these to be ripped off and welded back on, or additional plates added to them. None of that is present. So they're really nice. Now this little bit right here, this is normal. This is from manufacturing. That's got nothing to do with damage, and it's exactly the same on the other side. Looking down the side of the rail, doesn't appear to be anything really wrong with it. Again, all these rivets are present and accounted for and are holding. It's very uncommon to find the running board brackets still riveted on. For some reason, everyone loved to drill the rivets out and then bolt them in or weld them on or something like that. But this one is all original. And just looking at it, I don't really see any places where it was cracked and welded or sectioned. It's really nice. Center cross member, again, has all the rivets in it. So it looks like a pretty nice frame. And now I'll start measuring it. Now the first thing we checked is to see if the frame is diamond or angled, where one rail could be further forward than the other. Now we already measured it, and it's difficult to show you with the body on it, and I don't have a separate frame, but I do have this model. Now after unbolting the body and lifting it up slightly, we measured it from the furthest forward body mounting hole to the furthest rear on the opposite side this way and then did the same thing on the other way and both sides were exactly 80 inches which is right on target. Now before we remove the body we checked it from underneath using rivets on the cross members again measuring this way and that way. I don't remember what the measurement was but it was equal on both sides. Now, one thing I'll point out is, you may notice, 
the pulley is about centered with the front cross member and same thing with the transmission centered with the center cross member now I'm going to deliberately angle this frame slightly as you can see I bend the frame because of the way the engine's mounted if the frame's got any angle to it the pulley can move off center from the front cross member and the same thing on the back now if you look at a real car and the pulley is noticeably off center from the cross member it could indicate that the frame has been bent that's not a guarantee so you see somebody else's car that's like that don't go around telling everyone it's been on a bad wreck because there are other reasons it could be however if you have a car where the pulley was noticeably centered then it got in a collision and it's not that's a good indication the frame has probably been bent next we'll check the frame for sag now just about any model a frame will measure some sag to it when it's in use and it'll almost always be concentrated right here now this is for two reasons first the body starts here so from here back the sill and the frame rail kind of reinforce each other but most of all because the engine mount is right here so the weight of the engine and the transmission is being supported right here there's also three big holes for the mounting bolts right here so even if the frame is perfectly straight once you put the engine in it it will have some sag to it and that's just normal now the exception would be if the frame has been straightened because it's not uncommon for people to over bend these so this actually becomes the highest point of the frame and they deliberately do that so that the weight of the engine and transmission will make it straight and now for some useless trivia now at the time using the flywheel housing as a mounting point for the engine was actually pretty commonplace reason being most cars at the time use longitudinal springs in other words the springs ran lengthwise and when you do that the shackle for the front spring would usually end up somewhere around where the flywheel housing is so putting the engine mount directly on top of it or near it that would direct the weight of the engine right onto the front springs and take a lot of stress off the frame rail and none of that applies to the Model A because it uses transverse springs so why did Ford put the mount here anyway? I really have no idea but it works Now I've run a string lengthwise on the frame rail and we're measuring the sag right at the engine mount and as you can see it's about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Now this is with the weight of the engine on it so I'm going to put a jack under it and take the weight of the engine off and we'll see what it measures then. Okay, I've jacked it up to the point where it's starting to take the weight off the springs. So now it's changed to an eighth of an inch. So that's quite interesting. So the actual reading on this would be an eighth inch of sag. Now, that's not a lot. Any more than that, I'd probably worry about it and want to correct it. But the body and the hood has already been aligned to compensate for it so we're just going to leave it now since the body and the hood have been aligned to compensate for this this clearly happened before the collision probably just from old age another big thing to keep in mind is if the frame has too much sag to it the back of the engine will be lower than it should be and also the transmission will be lower than it should be 
and the front radius rod attaches to the bell housing, which means the mounting point for that will be lower than it should be. Now if you notice, when I move this up and down, the angle of the kingpin changes, which means this affects the caster angle. When you move this down, it increases positive caster. Now these cars were set up new with a few degrees of positive caster. It makes the front wheels want to turn in towards each other and makes the car want to go in a straight line. But with too much angle, they can start to fight each other. And this usually ends up with a certain speed range, usually around 15 to 20 miles per hour. The wheels can start wobbling, just fighting each other really bad. Now, I'm deliberately moving this more than it would be, just to make it obvious. But you don't need to move it very much to add one or two degrees. And that's all it takes to mess it up really good. And next we'll check the front of the frame to see if that's been angled. And we'll check it like we did the back. Measure it from one corner to another, and then the opposite, and compare the results. Now since the engine is in place, we can't use a tape measure. We need some kind of measuring device that'll fit over the engine. So, I made this. Now one side of this will attach to one of the hood hook mount holes, and the other side will attach to one of the radiator mount holes. So we'll try it one way and then the other and compare the results. Alright, I have this thing installed. So, one side I've got on the rear hood hook bolt hole, and it's pushed as far to the center as it'll go. And on this side, install this on the radiator mount hole, and so you can see, we push it all the way over until it touches. It's kind of at the front of the hole, not really centered. And trying it on the other side, and the measurement is just about the same, slightly towards the front. So, the front of the frame is perfectly centered, according to this. And now we'll check the frame horns. It's part of the frame from here forward. It's very commonplace for these to get bent up from front end collisions. Now we'll check it with a tape measure this way and then that way. And then we'll put a level between them to see if they're parallel. Now I'm running the tape measure from the tip of the frame to the front rivet holding the front cross member on. And it measures 25 and 3 quarter inches. Now the other side is about 25 and 7 eighths. So there's an eighth of an inch difference. So most likely this frame horn is bent in about an eighth of an inch. Now once again, it's not off by very much. Not really noticeable. Now since the front apron and the front fenders were already fitting pretty good, there's no point in disturbing any of that, so I'm just going to leave it. Now we'll check to see if they're level with each other. Now I have a level sitting across the front cross member, and as you can see the bubble is just touching the line on the right side. It doesn't need to be perfectly level, it just needs to be consistent. Now set it across the edge of the frame horns, and we got the same reading. It's just touching the one mark, and and across the center, same thing. Okay, so they are perfectly level with each other. Well, with all that data, we've established the frame has no damage from the collision, at least not measurable. There are a few other little things wrong with it, but as I've said, they're not worth worrying about. This is actually one of the nicest Model A frames I think I've ever seen. There's just not that much wrong with it. So, we're not going to make any repairs to it whatsoever. We're just going to reuse it as is. Well, that's it for this video. Now, as I've said in a previous video, the owner decided that since we have the car this far apart, we'll just repaint the whole thing. So, that's what we're in the process of doing now. 
Now the next video on it, I'm not entirely sure when that'll be. Probably a while from now. It'll be after we paint it and we'll be ready to reassemble it. Anyway, thank you very much for watching.